Hi, I'm making this tape for a friend of mine. Uh, six weeks ago she asked me why it was that I didn't support President Obama's foreign policy back in 2008. And I gave her a rather long answer, and so this is an aid memoir, a reprise of uh, the discussion that we had. When Bill Clinton was president and he was talking about the Camp David Accords, it was fairly easy to detect when he had gone to college because the theories that he gave about how war and peace happen uh, were the ones that he had studied in college back then and there was a sort of wave of revisionism that passes through the historical community every 20 years and when you listen to him you could hear what theories that he had studied in college. Uh, why are theories important? Because when theories are incorrect, when you do not understand how foreign relations uh, work and what causes war and how to maintain peace, um, you're unable to prevent war and you're unable to maintain peace. So I'm going to talk actually a little bit about um, the major uh, disaster that happened a hundred years ago, something that affected everybody's changes, everybody's theories rather, of uh, war and peace. Until that time, everybody clearly understood war was caused by fear, interest, and honor, to use Donald Kagan's um, uh, summary. But a hundred years ago marks the beginning of World War I. Now, there had been tensions in Europe prior to World War I. Uh, you had a case where uh, the German mothers kept their children at home because they, saw, they said the, the uh, UK Admiral Fischer is coming and they were worried about an invasion of Germany by the, uh, by the British. But when World War I started, things had been more or less calm and suddenly it blew out of nowhere. And so you, people had theories at the time and briefly thereafter and a little bit beforehand, what started wars? And so the, the, the thing that we hear today that uh, arms manufacturers promote war, well that dates from World War I. Uh, the notion that entangling alliances and secret treaties that dates from that period as well. And the notion that World War I started because once somebody mobilized, they were required, they must absolutely uh, go out and move all their troops on time. And once you called for mobilization, war was inevitable. That also dates from that time. By the way, none of those are true. Uh, arms manufacturers know, like all other people, that uh, running a business in a time of war is extremely difficult and uh, far less profitable. Um, entangling alliances and secret treaties had actually kept the peace in Europe for 20, for sorry, for 70 years. And it took a long concerted effort by the German government and mostly in the person of Kaiser Wilhelm II to destroy that uh, system of alliances and treaties uh, and bring about World War I. And uh, in terms of the railroad schedules demanding that once you started mobilizing your troops the military railroads military would seize control of the railroads and they had to move all the troops that isn't true they, they knew how to improvise so none of those explanations were true and people sort of floundered until eventually uh, they came back up with uh, other theories you know, many many years later once they had more information it really was fear interest and honor but people were floundering with alternative theories for many years afterwards skip forward 20 years it's 1938 the British uh, Prime Minister Chamberlain is desperately trying to avoid a general war in Europe. And um, the theory at the time was wars were caused by um, people with legitimate grievances uh, regarding national uh, homelands and uh, cont contiguity of uh, racial stereotypes. We'll, we'll uh, sort of put that aside, but the enlightened theory at the time was appeasement. It was not a dirty word. If we meet the people's grievances, there won't be a war. Okay, well, um, and in, the, in the event, of course, it didn't work out. Not only did it not uh, prevent a war because it was an incorrect theory. I mean, Chamberlain was operating off of that theory, but Hitler was not. Um, furthermore, once the war started, England and the France were in much, once the general war started rather, England and France were in much worse condition than they had otherwise had been in. And if they had uh, actually stood with Czechoslovakia, they would have been in much better condition. 
uh, for the general war, and, and, and in point of fact, they nearly lost the war. Okay. Skip forward another 20 years, and we come to probably, um, arguably, uh, the worst president uh, in, in terms of foreign affairs that we've had in the past 20 years here in the United States, uh, sorry, in the past 100 years here in the United States, and that would be President Kennedy. Uh, to list his foreign policy disasters, uh, there's the Bay of Pigs, uh, his American involvement in Vietnam, the Berlin Wall, and the Cuban Missile Crisis. And all these are related to President Kennedy's theories. President Kennedy had a theory that stated that, uh, which he had studied in college, and once again it was a theory about how World War I had started. And his theory in the that they had uh, taught him in college was, war start when there's lack of clear communication. So let's put aside Bay of Pigs, let's put aside the Vietnam War. President Kennedy is um, sitting there, and uh, he goes to the uh, 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 summit with Khrushchev. Now, at that summit, he makes two major blunders. Uh, the first blunder is because he believes in clear communication. Uh, therefore, it doesn't really make a difference what you say to somebody. Uh, you don't have to observe some of the diplomatic conventions and negotiating conventions. And he goes to Khrushchev and decides to give Khrushchev um, some face and tells Khrushchev, your nuclear missile arsenal is equivalent to the U.S. missile arsenal. Now, there are two problems with that. The first problem is that it certainly wasn't the case. They didn't have anything in Russia that could hit the United States. It simply wasn't true. The Russians knew it. and. The U.S. knew it, by the way, because the U.S. had spies in the Soviet infrastructure. So that was the first part of that, first reason why that was a blunder. Uh, the second reason it was a blunder is because uh, this gave the Russians, now the Russians at that time were taken to threatening the United States with nuclear annihilation. They're a superpower, just like we are. They're going to... Um, they have a, a nuclear force just like the United States does. We have to take them seriously. We have to uh, accommodate them militarily. Uh, because of their military threat, we have to accommodate them politically. So as you can probably imagine, Kennedy's advisors were besides themselves with, uh, at this particular blunder because that meant from going forward, the Russians could and uh, demand that the United States offer them more concessions in the diplomatic negotiations because after all their military power was equivalent. The second major blunder, and the only way to, uh, to uh, phrase it is that it's a faux pas, was that uh, Kennedy repudiated Eisenhower's policies to Khrushchev in private. And this was considered to be, once again, a major diplomatic blunder. You simply do not do that. You can as certainly as part of a democracy, uh, there's continuity of government. You don't repudiate the previous person's policies. You don't tell them it's mistaken. You don't say, I'm abandoning them. You can launch a new initiative. That happens all the time. But in terms of continuity of government, you don't do that kind of thing. And uh, well, the consequences, by the way, were fairly severe because we know what Khrushchev said and thought and uh, from his writings and from speaking to other people. And he walked away saying this guy, meaning Kennedy, was an amateur and that Khrushchev could roll him, essentially, and uh, force him to do things. That brings us to the Berlin Wall. Berlin was governed by a four-power agreement between the United States, uh, the Soviet Union, uh, England and France, and so access was supposed to be free. There's control, everybody had control of their sector, but access was supposed to be free and open. And one day, Khrushchev decides he's going to put up a wall because people are leaving East, East Berlin and sneaking over to the West. It looked bad. Now, um, Kennedy had, and the United States had full right to demolish the wall. And so the, the uh, Soviets go out, they build a fence, and they step back to see what the reaction is. Well, Kennedy thought it didn't make a difference. It didn't make a difference whether or not there was a wall there. Once again, there won't be a war. It's clear communication. It's Khrushchev's sphere. It'll make him feel better. That way he won't be nervous. That way we will have less diplomatic problems. Anyway, he lets them build the wall. And it was untold misery for the people of, uh, of Eastern Europe, but that's what Kennedy decided to do. So it was another major mistake by Kennedy. And finally, this brings us to the Cuban Missile Crisis. At this point, Khrushchev believes with a great deal of justification 
that uh, Kennedy is inexperienced and doesn't really know what he's doing. So the Russians, the Soviets, start moving missiles into Cuba. The United States finds out. What does Kennedy say? Well, Kennedy, uh, once again, it doesn't make a difference because even though there are missiles there, they won't be used. What causes wars? Lack of clear communications. I will clearly communicate with Khrushchev and these missiles make no difference. Well, once again, his advisors are having a fit because when the Soviet Union has nothing that can hit the United States in terms of nuclear armament, that's one thing, okay? But if you put 40 missiles into Cuba and those missiles can devastate the eastern seaboard of the United States, it's an ex extremely different strategic position and uh, a tremendous amount of problem. Kennedy's instinct was to say, okay, well, it doesn't really make a difference, but I have to calm down the U.S. population, so I'll issue a statement that says Cuba can't have more than 100 missiles there. And he says, and since they only have 40, it's not a problem. I don't have to worry about getting into a public tussle with the Russians, and after all, it doesn't make a difference. In the event, Kennedy's advisors forced him to make an issue of it, and that was the Cuban Missile Crisis. So Kennedy's inappropriate ideas or wrong ideas, things that he'd studied in college, it's not like he came up with it by himself, um, brought him to the Cuban Missile Crisis and mismanagement uh, of all those diplomatic relations. All right. This brings us to President Obama. Back in 2008, when President Obama was running for office, when I would listen to him speak, I got two major um, themes from when he was speaking. First of all, he was a great believer in his own personal charm. Now, Roosevelt was like that, President Roosevelt, Franklin. Um, President Kennedy was like that as well. And President Obama clearly believed in his great personal charm. I'm very popular in Germany. I'm going to be popular around the world. I'm such a great guy. He got the Nobel Peace Prize just for showing up, right? And he was right. The people uh, liked him. That's not really a good basis for negotiation. That's the Wars don't start or stop because of your great personal charm. The other thing that President, Kennedy, uh, President Obama said was that he's a great believer in internationalism. In other words, the legitimate use of force in international affairs derives from international law as um, worked through and voted upon in the United Nations. That was essentially what I heard him saying, uh, which is very interesting, but uh, I believe incorrect. Okay, that's, wars don't start and stop based on international law. We actually saw that in the League of Nations prior to World War II. There's World War I, there's a League of Nations, the League of Nations attempted to keep the peace, and the League of Nations turned out to be a dead letter, mainly because they were of their moral compromise. And uh, they had people who were not democratic as part of the League of Nations, they had people who were violating international norms as part of the League of Nations, and eventually the League of Nations voted itself out of business at the end of uh, World War II and just gave its money over to the United Nations. Okay, how does that play out in the event as we see in the past four years of the Obama administration? We also see something new came in which is sort of, I can't recall really picking up on it prior to uh, President Obama taking office, but he tends to sympathize with the left-leaning governments in, around the world. So, for example, he goes to Argentina, and instead of being appalled by Chavez taking, essentially, running the country as a dictatorship, nationalizing businesses, and giving jobs to his followers, and looting, you know, seizing control of the radio station and the TV so that he can uh, put out his party political propaganda and prevent his political enemies from uh, using any kind of communication system, and he embraces um, Chavez. But, for example, in Honduras, where a left-wing, was a general, decided to seize control of the government, or excuse, well, essentially was the president, left, uh, former general, left-wing, wants to seize control of the government, the Honduras um, Supreme Court rules against him, and they kick the guy out, and the United States comes down in favor of uh, the president who's trying to illegally seize power. Similar things happening in Colombia. Similar things happening in Mexico. I don't know what it is about Mexico, but uh, President Obama refuses to uh, 
honor the free trade agreement the United States signed with uh, Mexico. So, uh, very disturbing. Oh, uh, also in that left-leaning or anti-colonialist um, thinking, uh, as soon as he takes office, he returns gifts that were given to the United States by the UK and refuses to meet with the British Prime Minister uh, in a very insulting fashion. Uh, he refuses to speak to Netanyahu of Israel uh, and also, once again, behaves in a very insulting fashion. So it's a very much a sort of a liberation thinking. It's sort of hard for me to articulate because I frankly don't understand it very well. Um, so what are the results, actually, as it plays out? Furthermore, well, uh, comes to Libya. Uh, there's devastation in Libya. The United States may decide that in its own strategic best interest that it wants to intervene, but President Obama decides that the United States cannot intervene until the international community says it's okay. And so that's why we go, eventually the United States intervenes, leading from behind, whatever that means, in some sort of a coalition to um, alleviate the suffering in Libya. Uh, right now, we're, uh, as I'm making this recording, there's a problem in Syria. And once again, the United States has been talking back and forth and back and forth with all the people around the region and in the United Nations trying to get something done, but there are people in the region who couldn't care less. In fact, they like the disorder in Syria. They think that's a great thing. Maybe they can seize control of it. And so the United States, which may have a strategic interest in stability, and not to mention humanitarian interest, can't do anything. Uh, and of course, there's Iran. Iran is a terrifically important problem. Uh, there are people there who wish to have nuclear weapons. Their stated goal is to uh, use those weapons as a means of intimidating their neighbors, uh, intimidating their uh, in the region, and for that matter, their missiles could reach Europe. And uh, that's intimidating when you have a bunch of crazy people with nuclear weapons on board. It's in the United States' best strategic interest to prevent any kind of attack by Iran. It's in the United States' best strategic interest to prevent Iran from having a nuclear weapon. But because the United States at this time under President Obama is acting on a policy that requires internationalism and consent and consensus, really very, much, very little is happening in the way of actions against Iran. So those are the reasons that I opposed President Obama, his um, theories of war and peace. Um, in the event, I believe that my opposition was justified. And uh, that's one of the reasons that I opposed him then and I oppose him now.